on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain. Jesus had set for their meeting. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking himself totally. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marking them by baptism, and a threefold name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I will be with you to do this this day, and I will be with you to do this day after day after day, right up until the end of the age. Amen. And I realized I didn't give you all time to scroll to it, so sorry. <laughs> This is a passage of scripture that I know you're all familiar with, although you've probably not heard it read quite that way recently. If you haven't opened, open your Bibles or your electronic device to Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. And while you're doing that, I'm going to get ready to pray, so I'm going to tell you that. So I'm going to pray for you as soon as I see your faces looking at me again, and I know that you're kind of there and ready. Lord Jesus, I thank you again for the opportunity to come into your house. I thank you again, Lord, that we can open your word and be blessed by what you say to us. Through your word, through your Holy Spirit, through the singing, through everything that we do when we honestly open our hearts to you. So God, today, I ask that you would use these words that you, would, that you have given me to make a difference in somebody's life. I pray, Lord, that you would use this music that we have just sung to open our hearts and make a difference in our lives. And God, I pray that you would be blessed by our efforts to serve you. Today, Lord, hide me in the shadow of your cross, that I would only speak your words and protect the ears that hear, that they would hear exactly what you have for them today. We'll give you all the glory. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I told you last week that I was starting a new series that speaks to us about what it means to move past where we are in our spiritual walk with Jesus. If you were here last week, you know that we talked a little bit about doing nothing, right? Doing nothing. So we're going to take that thought and we're going to move a little further today. I told you last week that I was planning to call this series The Rest of the Story. The Rest of the Story. Because I want you to look at what happens to us when we follow Christ after salvation. It's the rest of the story. If any of you ever listened to Paul Harvey, I can tell who's old enough to know who Paul Harvey is. <laughs> If you ever listen to Paul Harvey, he always said, and now, the rest of the story, right? This is the rest of the story. We can't just stop at salvation. If we could, there wouldn't be any point in us living any longer. We could kneel at a cross, say, Jesus, I accept you, and poof, we're gone up to heaven, because we wouldn't have any purpose. But there's more to the story, and we need to look at some of that. I learned a while back that God uses people to mold me. You know that? God uses people to mold me. People speak into my life. They change me. I've watched as he's brought people who challenge me in my walk with Christ. They challenge my ideas or my desires. I've seen people who seem to have a purpose of walking with me for a short time. <coughs> They speak some truth into my life, and then they're gone. Maybe they're not completely gone. You know, sometimes we, we meet people, they speak something into our lives, we're challenged or we're changed, and yet that relationship never really develops. And they're still around, but we're not real close. Sometimes there's people like that. But the truth is, they don't completely disappear, even if they don't get close to your life. They speak truth, they challenge you, they change you, because the Holy Spirit uses them. 
With that said, I've also come to realize that God puts people in my life who make me better. I feel very blessed to have these kind of people around me. These are the kind of people who always challenge me and often help me <coughs> live closer to God, <coughs> make my car run. I mean, it could be a lot of different things that they do, but whatever they do, they seem to keep on blessing. No matter what, their friendship, their time, their talent, the things that they're good at and the things that they're not so good at, they all seem to mold me in some way. I assume most of you already know this, but Barb, my wife Barb, is the, that person that is most influential on me. She's the one who speaks into my life the most. She's the one who challenges me the most. She's the one who says, okay, shut up. You said too much. She's also the one that, when I go home from preaching a message, sometimes will say to me, do you really not like it here? And I'll say, why? And she'll say, man, well, you just said they probably fire you next morning. <laughs> she's that person. But she's close to me like that. And she's somebody that, maybe you know this already, but she's somebody that I talk to all the time. We talk about things like um, what's going on in our lives, what's going on in the spirit world with us. When we're reading our scripture or praying together, we discuss that. See, Barb speaks truth into me, and yet she still supports me. She challenges me, and yet she walks with me. And she's added, she's an added bonus because she also has a call on her life. Amen. You know, each of us who are walking with Christ have a call. Amen. Maybe that call is to reach the people around you. Maybe that call is to teach. Maybe that call is to play a piano. Maybe that call is to reach out to other people's children. <clears throat> Maybe that call is to support and Barb's call has to do with ministry. So, that's an added bonus because she is often behind the scenes of, our, of my sermon. I call it our sermon a lot because often, as I'm writing my sermon, I'm saying to Barb, and, and it doesn't work like, hey, here, read this about my sermon and tell me what you think. It's like, we're talking scripture, we're reading together, we're praying together and we'll start talking and we'll start talking about things and how they're changing in our lives and that feeds right into what God's telling me or showing me as I'm writing my sermon. So when you hear me preach, you often hear some of Barb's heart. I want to share that with you. Now, if that's the case, and we're talking about this as the rest of the story. See, the rest of the story was Barb's idea. And then we were talking some more, and she said, well, maybe we'll just call it Jesus, then beyond. <coughs> now, my brain took off with that. I was like, yeah, we can do the Star Wars theme. And I was really like coming back on the screen. She didn't like that. She said, no, it's a little too far. So, again, she said, do you not like it here? <laughs> so, so now the question becomes, why do I share all of that with you this morning? And the answer is simply, I want you to understand that if you're going to walk this walk with Jesus, and you want to be the best that you can be in this walk, you will have to allow other people opportunities to speak into your life. Amen. You're going to have to allow other people opportunities to speak into your life. Sometimes it looks like a good friendship. Sometimes it looks like a good marriage. <coughs> Sometimes it looks like a conflict. Do you get that? Sometimes it's not what you want to hear. Sometimes it makes you want to fight. <coughs> 
Sometimes it looks like a conflict. But no matter what, it always makes you better and it always brings you closer to God. You have to allow other people the opportunity to speak into your life. The last point before I get into the meat of the sermon today is remember what I said last week. And I really want you to hear this. If you leave church in the same spiritual condition that you came in, it's your fault. Nobody's to blame but for that but you. Only you can decide to accept what you hear. Only you can decide to engage God through the worship, through the music. Only you. I know, and I don't know if there's anybody here today, but I know there's people that will not go to a church because of the style of music. Some people want more guitar. Some people want no guitar. Some people want more band. Some people want one person. Some people want a whole lot of sound and music. Other people want a soloist with no music at all. There are people that don't go to a certain place because of a style. It's your choice. You can choose to come in here and allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through all of this that happens up here. Or you can choose to come in here, and I know some people like this. Come in here, sit in your chair. Say, go ahead. Try to bless me. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I don't care. Go ahead. Try. Right? It's your choice. So you can come in here and you can do something with what you hear. Or you can come in here, go through the motions. Here's where that's. She's not here to tell me that I <laughs> might not have a job next week. So you can choose to come in here and waste two hours of your day. You can. You can choose that. I don't know why you would, but you can. If you're not willing to hear, and you're not willing to engage, and you're not willing to listen to what God's saying to you, then you're wasting your time. So you have to be willing to let the Holy Spirit speak to you and change you through the words He chooses to speak through me and those around you while you're here. Otherwise, again, you're wasting your time. Okay. So let's look at this passage again. It's Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20. And I know Amy, <coughs> sorry about that. I know Amy already read it, but I want to read it again. Because it just speaks to me every time I read it. It says, Meanwhile, the eleven apostles, or disciples, were on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain Jesus had set for their reunion. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Though some though held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his chain, his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life, marking them by baptism in a threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this, day after day, right up to the end of the age. I want to look at this passage a little bit different today. Maybe you could say in a little bit different light. If you haven't noticed, we have a little bit different light around here. The guys figured out if we turned some things around and did a couple things different, it lights the place up a lot better. And it does. We're going to look at this in a little different light today. I've already shared this passage with you before. It's not the first time that I have preached from Matthew 28, and it's definitely not the first time you've heard a message from chapter 28 of Matthew. Probably you've heard that from many different preachers over the years. It's, it's known as the Great Commission. It's the Great Commission. It's Jesus speaking to his followers one last time before he ascends to heaven. During the conversation, he challenges them to go. 
to make and to teach. But what else does he say in these few words? I read about a pastor who said, I want to make a huge impact on the kingdom with the time I have left. And according to the article, he was very enthusiastic about making this his life goal. Making a huge impact on the kingdom. Sometimes we feel like we have to do everything. Sometimes we, have, we feel like we have to reach everyone. Or change everything. Well, if we're going to be successful in this Christian life, we have to make a huge impact. But the truth is, we can't take this kind of pressure. We can't live in this kind of pressure. We're just not capable of doing everything everyone wants every time a need shows up. Do you realize that? We're not capable of doing everything everyone wants every time a need shows up. What we are capable of doing is living our lives in a way that shows we are authentic in our faith and true to our Lord. Right. Amen. We're capable of that if we decide to do it. We're capable of living our lives in a way that shows our faith is real. Right? right. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> See, we can make a difference in our homes as we live the truth of Christ around our family. If you want to make a difference, if you want to make an impact in your home, live Jesus there. Something that I see happen a lot in families, if we come to church and we have this Christian life, we go to work and we might speak truth and sort of live, but when we go home, we tend to be very comfortable at home. We just put our feet up and be like we are. And we forget all about our faith. We forget all about how we're supposed to treat others. We forget all about serving, which is what Christianity is supposed to be about. And instead, our spouse doesn't go to church. So we treat them like, I'm not going to say that word. We treat them back. I caught myself, see? Don't we? I mean, think about it. Who's the most important people in your life? They're living under that same roof. Right. And yet, we treat them the worst. They catch all of our problems. They catch all of our attitude. You want to make a difference at home? Live Jesus there. We can reach out to people, the people that God brings into our path each day, and we can share as he directs us. So as you're going through your life, as you're walking in the store or at work or teaching your class, you can share just through the way you live. Often, people will ask you why. Why are you like that? Why do you treat other people nice? Everybody treats you terrible. Why do you treat them nice? Well, you know what? I call that an open door. You see, I have this, this Savior in my life that has changed me. And because of that, I have decided I'm going to walk with Him even when people don't like me. It's just a way of life. We can lead and teach the people who are, who are in or will join our groups. But... We can't change everything. I like the way the message says this because it brings it into today's language for me. And if you didn't catch it, that's where we read that from. Matthew 28, 16 through 20 in the message. Verse 17 says, The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves Huh. There's some other versions out there, and they say things like, 
when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful, or some doubted, depending on which versions you're looking at. They all kind of say the same. I really like the way the message says it because it brings it right there. There's no question about what that's saying. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back. They weren't sure about worship. They weren't sure about risking themselves totally. Excuse me. I can't help but think this is what we often do. We hold back. We're not sure about worship. We don't want to risk ourselves totally because what if somebody makes fun of us? <clears throat> what if somebody has a better sounding idea? What if somebody tries to reason us, reason with us about a better way to live? It doesn't really make sense. I mean, I don't know. I was reading this morning or last night about Bill Nye, the science guy, in a debate with Ken Ham, who is the guy that started the Creation Museum and the whole Answers in Genesis, which is all, the whole ministry is based on a, a young earth and a, and a six day, literally 24 hour creation. Bill Nye doesn't believe that, by the way. <clears throat> He's a scientist. Right? Scientists have other beliefs about how creation and evolution, even if they're somewhat of the faith, um, they have ideas about how that might work together or how it doesn't work at all. We, we talk and we listen and we read, but we might hear something that actually makes sense. You know, it's, if you remember a few months ago, I talked to you about empirical truth, empirical evidence, something that you can touch, see, feel, smell, taste, Sometimes people come up with ideas or arguments that make sense <clears throat> empirically. They don't work in our faith. What do we do with that? But here, listen on. It says Jesus was undeterred. He didn't turn away because somebody wasn't listening or because some doubted. He didn't stop. He was undeterred. He was not put out that some had held back. <clears throat> just that he just gave them the words the Father had given him. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life. Marking them by the baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. So if we're told by Jesus to go out and train everyone we meet, that what I'm saying doesn't make sense. I've just told you, you can't change everything. You can't change everyone. You can't meet every need. But Jesus says, go. Right? Go and train everyone. Everyone you meet. Everyone you come in contact with. It's not what Jesus says, it's what Jesus does that gives us hope. See, we're to follow his commission, but we're also to follow his example. He was undeterred by the people who were hesitant or unwilling to follow him. Each of us has talents or gifts. And we can, and we should, share it. And each of us has a part to play in go into all the world, as Jesus commanded us. But none of us can do it all. You're not supposed to be a lone wolf with a great plan. A lone wolf is killed by the pack. And 
Churches are no different. If we have somebody who decides they're going to take command and do what they want to do, and they're going running, what do we do? We ask them, don't we? Well, we like we don't reach out and try to love them back. We just say, "Get out of here! You're out of here." <coughs> Churches are the only place to shoot their wounded. We're the only ones. We don't forgive, even though that's like what God says to do. If somebody does us wrong, they're out. See ya. Right? <coughs> You're not supposed to be a lone wolf. It doesn't matter how great your plan is. You're not supposed to be a lone wolf. You're supposed to fulfill your call and do your part, but you are not <coughs> meant to change the world all by yourself. It's the Lord. That's done by being part of a team. That's done by joining together with others who have talents and gifts that you don't have. Pastor Andy, Andy Stanley, I think most of you probably have heard of him. He teaches his congregation, do for one what you can't do for all. Do for one what you can't do for all. You can't do it all, but you can do something. What would happen if you were to touch one person every day with the gospel of Jesus? I'll tell you what would happen. The world around you would be changed for the better. If you were to touch one person every day with the gospel of Jesus, that doesn't mean that you have to speak I might have to sink in a little Sometimes we're the only Bible people will read. Sometimes we open our mouth and we become another Bible they won't read. Right. Right? What would happen if you reached out to people in a way of grace? Remember grace? Unmerited favor? Unearned favor? Grace, you know, kind of like what God gave to you and I when he accepted us into his family. Amen. What would happen if you reacted to people in a way of grace? I'll tell you what would happen. The world around you would change for the better. Amen. What if you approached people in the way God approached you? What if you approached people in the way God approached you? With love and patience. God's way. I'll tell you what would happen. The world around you would change for the better. Only you can change the world around you. Only you. So what will you do? Something else I want to be sure you hear me say today is this. Every one of you is a minister. So often I hear about ministry opportunity that needs to happen or that the church should consider. I've heard people say that the church needs to start a new ministry to this or that. I've heard people say the church should do something about the known need in the community. But, but, I want to be sure you're hearing this, so take a second. Look at me. Are you ready? Look at me. Are you ready? Are you listening? Here it is. You are the church. Amen. You are the church. Right. It's not here. It's in here. It's in there. It's you. You are the church. So, since you're the church, go ahead and do those things. I'm giving you permission. And I don't have to. Because I don't have authority to give you permission. You're the church. Do it. You don't need permission to help someone in need. You don't need permission to reach out to someone you see. 
You don't need permission to start something that will change someone else's world for Jesus. Just do it. Nike, I know you all know Nike. Nike really had a great slogan when it started using this thing. Just do it. In other words, when you see something that needs done, it's probably a good, a good indication that you're supposed to do it. That you're supposed to get involved. Just do it. Be the church. Last week I talked to you about stopping, doing nothing, preparing to meet Jesus, and allowing yourself the rest you need so that you're ready to do what Jesus asked of you. Today I hope you'll leave here thinking of ways you can rest as you become the church Jesus died to make. Jesus died to change. You can't do it all. So don't let it overwhelm you. Instead, do for one what you can't do for everyone. Will you stand with me for a benediction? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Go today and be the church to someone else. Lord Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the way you challenge us through your word. And I thank you, Lord, that if we're willing to listen, you'll change us. Help us, Lord, to be the church. Everywhere we go, just do it. Just when we see something that needs done, that we just do it. When we see someone who's in need, we just reach out and touch them. We do what we can because we are the church. And help us, Lord, to live that way. We'll give you glory and praise. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace to you. Amen.